but I don't know where he is. Okay. Okay, if I start? Are you ready? Okay, good evening, everyone. I think, or sorry, good good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm rushing the day. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. 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 Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Lori Turnbull. I am the director of the School of Public Administration. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are in uh, Mi'kmaq, the ancest ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I'd like to first, I'd like to start, secondly, by thanking the McKechnie Institute and the Office of the President here at Dalhousie for sponsoring the event today. Um, before we get started on today's event, I want to draw your attention to another very noteworthy event organized by the McKechnie Institute. Um, it will be happening on campus next Monday, February 3rd. It's called Making It Count, Assessing the Impact of the Decade for People of African Descent on Policy in Nova Scotia. Speakers include E.L. Jones, Wayne Hamilton, Lindell Smith, and Crystal Watson. The panel will be chaired by Amisor Dryden, James R. Johnson Chair in Black Canadian Studies. So uh, before I turn things over, I'm gonna introduce uh, our panel chair for this afternoon, Dr. Rajai Parizram, who is founding fellow at the McKechnie Institute and co-organizer for today's event. Uh, Professor er Perez Rem is a multi-generational, transnational byproduct of British colonialism whose background connects South Asia, the Caribbean, and Turtle Island. His teach he teaches in the departments of International Development Studies and History here at Dalhousie and is cross-appointed in political science. Ajay has a PhD in political science with specializations in international relations, comparative politics, political economy from Carleton University, and has edited a grassroots newspaper while in Ottawa. His research coalesces around the problem of the colonial present or the various ways colonial encounters continue to structure and limit the range of what seems possible. This has taken the form of researching, writing, and consulting on the subject of Canadian foreign, immigration, and citizenship policy, race and racism, decolonialization, as well as colonial and post-colonial state formation and development. Ajay has also worked as a federal public servant and a researcher based at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. So thank you very much, everyone, and let's welcome Ajay to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, I am going to be extremely brief because we have a brilliant panel of people who uh, were kind enough to come uh, at our invitation. So I'm just going to say a few words about kind of what led to the formation of this uh, panel. So Kevin, Lori, and I, we started talking actually back in October when uh, the infamous Trudeau blackface, brownface scandal happened. And uh, we were chatting and trying to decide, should we, be, should we try and do something right away? And we decided, well, no, let's wait until the news cycle moves on and nobody cares about racism anymore. <laughs> so January, we couldn't do February because people care in February for a little bit. <laughs> so we, had to, we thought January would be the, the best time to, uh, to land on that. So, so here we are. Um, so anyway, about that though, so the thoughts on the time was that obviously the blackface incident, it was offensive, it was racist, but it wasn't really that surprising because the prime minister in a racist costume and being ignorant to that racism is, is the logical extension of a country in which structural racism is actually in the bedrock of the nation state itself. and in a way that has never been adequately acknowledged. You know what I mean? This hasn't been adequately acknowledged. We, we can say that we, we go through these motions sometimes, but we haven't done the work to, to move beyond that. And I'd, you know, look no further than the land beneath your feet. It's not just that our university imposes itself over top of unceded Mi'kmaq territory. It's that all of so-called New Scotland depends on strategies that deny the resurgence of Mi'kmaq. And I think that's a different and important way of thinking about it that the structures within which we operate are predicated on denying the resurgence and return to kind of a rightful place of uh, indigenous presence. Um, 
And if you, want, if you think that sounds abstract or just academic, I would invite you to visit the Treaty Truck House that's uh, built on the banks of the Shubia River in accordance with the Peace and Friendship Treaty of 1752 and learn the details of this, uh, of how the legalistic and technocratic attempts to undermine water protectors and grassroots grandmothers has been over the last several years. And we need to do that if we're going to understand what it means to live life in the colonial present, which is the area of research that I work in. So I don't want to spend, I don't want us to have to spend any time today trying to prove that Canada as a structure is a racist imposition. This panel starts with the premise that that's where we are uh, in order to move forward. Uh, if you need any proof of this, I've actually, I've written it down in an essay that came out in Studies in Political Economy. It's called Pathological White Fragility in the Canadian State, and I'm happy to make that available to anybody for free. If you, if you want it, just send me a note. Uh, my area of research, and I'll leave with this, is actually, you know, colonial state formation in South Asia, but since I arrived at Dalhousie as a diversity hire in the year 2016, it sort of forced me at the request uh, urgent request at times of my students to spend a portion of my research time thinking about white supremacy, structural racism, and how to dismantle it. So combating white fragility or the inability of white people to understand themselves in racial terms seems a useful starting point to do that. So today we've amassed a brilliant panel of people to talk about strategies for dismantling racial fragility in our public institutions. And I'm going to come back up each time just to introduce each speaker. Um, and then we'll have lots of time available for uh, public uh, conversation. So I think we are going to give uh, Dr. Gaynor Watson Creed the, the first word. Uh, she's the ass Assistant Dean of Medicine for serving and... Oh, okay. Dr. Watson Creed will go uh, <laughs> later. <laughs> no problem. So. I'll introduce instead Dr. Alex Kasnabish, a good pal of mine and a writer, researcher, and teacher committed to collective liberation, living in Halifax, Nova Scotia, in unceded Mi'kmaq territory. He is associate professor in sociology and anthropology at Mount St. Vincent University. His research focuses on the radical imagination, radical politics, social justice, and social movements. Many of you would have been to the radical uh, imagination projects over the last several years in, this, in, the, in town. His recent books include What Moves Us, the, Li the Lives and Times of Radical Imagination, co-edited with Max Haven, and a tremendous uh, roster of uh, authors. The Radical Imagination, Social Movement Research in the Age of Austerity, also with Max, and Insurgent Encounters, Transnational Ethnography, Activism, and the Political, co-edited with Jeffrey Jurist. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kasnabish. Uh, thank you, AJ. Thanks to everyone who uh, did all the hard work of organizing this event. Thank you all for being here, and thanks to my fellow panelists. I'm uh, really, really excited to hear what everyone has to say. I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm just getting over a cold, so I hope I don't uh, end up uh, interrupting myself to, uh, to clear my throat too often, but just bear with me if my voice sounds a little croaky. <clears throat> in what follows, I aim not to present a diagnostic line of analysis about white fragility, resurgent fascism, and eco-social crisis, but a series of vignettes that trace some important contours of the problem at hand and point to some of the work that I think we have to do. In 2018, the American Society of Human Genetics, the largest professional association of its kind in the world, released a statement expressing alarm at the, quote, societal resurgence of groups rejecting the value of genetic diversity and using discredited or distorted genetic concepts to bolster bogus claims of white supremacy, end quote, and denouncing, quote, this misuse of genetics to feed racist ideologies, end quote. Let that sink in. More than two centuries after the bogus pseudoscience of phrenology was employed as an alibi for the colonial schemes and genocidal violence of the European ruling class, more than a century after the eugenics movement fueled the fires of fascism, here we are again having a public conversation about the basic humanity of non-white peoples. That the American Society of Human Genetics, hardly a, hardly a politically bombastic organization, felt compelled to issue this unequivocal statement disavowing the misuse of genetic science to underwrite white supremacy and racism is a clear indictment of the failure to effectively confront what W.E.B. Du Bois called the wages of whiteness, 
the public and psychological benefits enjoyed by whites in a white supremacist society in a larger context of entrenched relations of oppression and exploitation. Of course, <clears throat> phrenology has also made a comeback recently, with alt-light publications like the Quillette offering defenses of it a century after it was thoroughly debunked by anthropologist Franz Boas and others. Today, amidst spiraling eco-social crises, a vast array of conspiracy theories travel social media networks, scapegoating vulnerable and marginalized groups through narratives that ought to seem ridiculous, but aren't, because their resonance feeds acts of public, spectacular, targeted violence against those very groups. Ubiquitously, free speech is invoked like a magic spell, most often by those who have never had any real restriction on their ability to say what they like. Over and above the concerns of groups of people whose basic dignity and right to exist is explicitly called into question by far-right organizing, masquerading as speech. While we could throw a rock and hit a dozen instances of the weaponization of free speech by the far right in order to demean, diminish, and incite violence against vulnerable groups, the Fuhrer being whipped up by the post-millennial against Omar Khadr and his appearance at an event at Dalhousie University about child soldiers, the rights of children, and radicalization serves to starkly reveal the grinding hypocrisy of such claims. In recent posts circulating freely on social media, the enraged and aggrieved not only condemn Cotter getting a platform at all, but actually call explicitly for his murder. Apparently, audience members will no longer be allowed to bring bags into the event for fear that someone will bring in a weapon. Let that sink in. For the far right, free speech is weaponized to provoke, dehumanize, and create politically useful spectacle. While much has been made of the so-called cancel culture and deplatforming, Report after report has demonstrated that if indeed there is a war against free speech on university campuses, it is today, as it has always been, carried out most frequently against leftist professors, students, and invited speakers, rather than those on the right. Two years ago, my own institution and St. Mary's University welcomed Lindsay Shepard, the Laurier Cultural Studies graduate student and free, and free speech grifter, made famous by her orchestrated controversy involving her choice to screen two videos featuring free speech grifter par excellence, Jordan Peterson, in a tutorial. Shepard, like many free speech grifters, is remarkable because she is fundamentally so unremarkable. <laughs> she is famous because she successfully marketed her profound sense of aggrieved entitlement for facilitating a transphobic debate in her tutorial and being mildly disciplined for it. Shepard has produced no significant works of art, literature, or scholarship. She has not taken risks that have cost her anything in the pursuit of making the world a more just place. It's important to understand the link between the university and broader society in the face of the resurgence of the far right and fascism. Attacks marshaled by academics on the basic dignity and humanity of specific groups of people, cloaked in the disingenuous alibi of academic freedom, feed directly into institutional and interpersonal violence. Juxtaposing the massacre carried out by avowed white supremacist Dylan Roof on June 17, 2015 of nine black parishioners in the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, and the scholarly white supremacy enacted by Charles Murray and Richard Herrnstein in their infamous book, The Bell Curve, George Lipsitz observes, quote, Dylan Roof destroyed the lives of nine people by firing his gun. The arguments made by Charles Murray, Richard Herrnstein, and James Q. Wilson are used to oppose school desegregation, fair housing practices, affirmative action, culturally sensitive curricula and pedagogies, and expenditures on public health. These arguments serve as crucial forms of justification and excuses for practices that destroy millions of lives. The indirect and inferential racism of Murray, Herrnstein, and Wilson is not less racist than the direct and referential racism of Dylan Roof. It is simply more effectively racist, end quote. Lipsitz's assessment that the white supremacist racist uh, social pseudoscience of figures like Murray and Herrnstein is actually more effectively racist than outright acts of racial terror should be sobering, particularly for those of us who work inside institutions like the university. While our attention is easily drawn to shocking acts of public violence enacted in the name of racial supremacy, we often fail to pay the same attention to the institutional, bloodless, technocratic ways in which people's humanity is degraded and their lives made much more precarious. The university is far from the only public institution plagued by this. On, Jerry, on January 16, 2020, 
news broke that Patrick Matthews, a reserve soldier with the Canadian Armed Forces who had trained as a combat engineer, had been arrested by the FBI, along with two other members of the neo-Nazi accelerationist insurrectionary group, The Base. After Winnipeg Free Press reporter Ryan Thorpe broke the story that Matthews was actively recruiting for the base, leading to his investigation by the armed forces and the RCMP, Matthews fled across the border to train U.S. members of the base. Despite repeated statements by the Canadian Armed Forces that racism is taken very seriously by the institution, investigative reporters continue to break stories about white supremacists working, organizing, and recruiting in the forces. As sociologist Kathleen Ballou has demonstrated in her outstanding work about the relationship between militarism and white supremacist organizing violence in the U.S., despite official claims to the contrary, there is a long and enduring relationship between white supremacists and the military. White supremacist groups have actively targeted members of the military for recruitment because of the valuable combat skills and equipment they believe they can bring to the coming race war. When Matthews and his fellow base members were arrested, they were on their way to a pro-gun rally in Richmond, Virginia. They had stockpiled 1,500 rounds of ammunition, built a functioning assault rifle, and made propaganda encouraging others to derail trains, murder people, and poison water supplies. They had discussed killing a police officer and committing acts of terrorism at the rally in Virginia to incite a race war. The far right have been the most dangerous domestic terror threat in the U.S. and Canada in recent years, accounting for 73% of such killings from 2009 to 2018. The whiteness and maleness of the perpetrators distinguishes them insofar as it engenders empathy and a search for underlying causes that might have led them to this end. Unlike the violence enacted by non-white subjects, it's never taken as an indictment of an entire class of human beings. Indeed, the subtext to it often seems to be a certainty that diversity, multiculturalism, feminism, amongst other SJW boogeymen, have driven these men to commit desperate acts. Even when they are identified as perpetrators, they are never at fault. Mere days after Matthew's arrest, a post-media news article circulated entitled, and just so you're clear, I'm not joking here, quote, alleged Manitoba white supremacist had an African-Canadian girlfriend, his mother says, end quote. Acknowledging Matthew's undeniable white supremacist convictions and racial hatred of others, the article quickly launches into a narrative about how Matthew's current beliefs didn't seem to jibe with fond family memories of his childhood and upbringing. We are told that he has Asperger's, that he dated a black woman, that he was bullied in school. The article dwells on the contradictions of Matthew's life and paints an undeniably sympathetic portrait of its subject. Matthew's is a victim. His radicalization is enti understood entirely idiosyncratically, and we are left not with a clear window into organized white supremacist terrorism, but a confounding, autobiographical, and empathy-baiting human interest story. <clears throat> Sociologist Michael Kimmel, whose work on masculinity and violence is indispensable, has described the sentiment animating the resurgence of the far right and open white supremacist politics as aggrieved entitlement. In the context of not insignificant gains towards equality made by women, racialized minorities, immigrants, and others who had been successfully excluded for decades, as well as the deepening of capitalist precarity, alienation, and austerity, white men in particular have experienced these changes and challenges as theft of what is rightfully theirs. Through the lens of white fragility, we can understand aggrieved entitlement as what George Lipsitz has named the possessive investment in whiteness. As Lipsitz explains, and I quote at length just by way of conclusion here, quote, the possessive investment in whiteness creates a vicious cycle. The more fearful, fragile, and headed for failure that whites feel, the more avidly they pursue the idealized fantasy of uninhibited power and agency to which they believe their whiteness entitles them. In the early 21st century, when the organization of the economy, the environment, the educational system, and the political process all increasingly come to serve the interests and aspirations only of the wealthy, more and more whites correctly see themselves as displaced and dispossessed. But in directing their ire against individuals and groups even more aggrieved than they are, they become consumed with hatred of others and unable to diagnose the actual causes of their problems. They come to recognize and understand themselves largely through their enmity. The best thing that could happen to white poor, the white poor, the white working class, and the white middle class would be to disinvest in their whiteness and join with other exploited and aggrieved people across racial lines. 
but without an understanding of how the possessive investment in whiteness serves to sustain a system of racialized capitalism, they do not know that. Instead, they become agents of an ever-escalating cycle of moral panics and paroxysms of violence that fuel desires for sadistic power and punishment." End quote. At no point do those moved by sentiments such as these recognize that their losses, real or perceived, are due to a web of power relations that could be challenged and changed for the collective benefit of all. Instead, weaned on privilege and power, those whose material and symbolic entitlements are tied to dominant identity categories seek to claim, reclaim what is lost or under threat by targeting those who have already been suffering under those very same relations. The path forward is defined by identifying, analyzing, dismantling, and then replacing dominant relations of oppression and exploitation with something that looks a lot more like collective liberation. This isn't about sinking into the subjective. We will not end white supremacy through therapy. It's about <laughs> clearly identifying the way, <laughs> it's true. It's about clearly identifying the way power operates. It's about the institutions we need and the social relations that are capable of sustaining them and us. It is perhaps most fundamentally about finding ways to cultivate the radical imagination necessary to even envision such possibilities in the first place. Thank you. Well, that was a brilliant way to kick us off. Uh, next up, we're going to have Dr. Rachel Zellers, who's Assistant Professor in the Department of Social Justice and Community Studies at St. Mary's University. Originally a farm girl from upstate New York, Rachel B. Zellers is a lawyer and assistant professor in the aforementioned department. Uh, and before that, she served as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Vermont in the Department of History, where her work focused on the history of black migration and slavery in the Maritimes beginning in the 18th century. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Zellers. Thank you. I'm going to... Uh, if it's okay, let me see if it's okay, it's on. If it's okay with everyone, I'm going to sit down. My vision is not so great at a particular distance, so I, I apologize. Let me just say hi to everybody in the back. I apologize that I won't be standing, and I, I look forward to hearing from you. Hey! Um, when we have that question and, and answer period, so I'm, I'm just gonna sit down. Um, I really did try to plan for my time today as if I was sitting with everyone in this room and we were like workshopping together. So um, I'm going to offer three practices together today to share with you. Um, so this question of how um, racism and white fragility manifests at the structural level within public institutions and community associations, so, so important, I have something to say about that, um, is where we're at, and so I'm offering these three, three practices uh, as a response to that idea or question. Um, the very first practice that came to mind for me is the idea of starting at the smallest scale, um, which is the interpersonal, uh, the interpersonal and for many of us in our learning or classroom spaces. How can we better attend, the starting question, how can we better attend to the importance of moving from, from margin to center in our thinking and in our pedagogical practices. And why small scale, right? That's often, I think, one of uh, the first uh, questions that crops up. Small scale for me, and to enter into this room, is the bedrock of abolition, which is the freedom work of black peoples, right? So small scale thinking as a bedrock of, of abolition, transformative justice, community accountability, processes for those of you that are familiar with those terms, and because those logics are deeply black loving, as I'll unpack in just a few moments. Um, so, so to begin, I want to ask everyone in this room, how do you talk about whiteness in your classroom spaces, right? How do you talk about whiteness? I want to start by suggesting that we get more comfortable with the notion of whiteness as a logic, right, and move away from whiteness as skin color or body. Um, here's a definition I use. Whiteness is a way of being that consummates self-preservation. Whiteness begins with the self as the first and final referent and in a way of behaving that typically conflates <coughs> or erases. Um, for critical race thinkers, uh, for those of us that have done that work for decades, this is, uh, this is what we refer to as the, the logic of whiteness as property. 
racial whiteness is not only a property right strengthened within laws and codes, it is also a set of behaviors that acts in the preservation of the self and that character um, with, that prop with respect to that property right. So I want to just work with some of my favorite thinkers and offer more about this idea as whiteness as a logic. Ta-Nehisi Coates refers to whiteness as a way of fencing in and fencing out, setting the terms in our society of who belongs, who belongs to institutions uh, and communities specifically in his article, The Case for Represent Reparations, right? His whole historical analysis is whiteness as uh, a fencing out of black peoples of particular communities and the, the process of redlining. Um, James Baldwin, uh, in a related fashion, speaks as whiteness as an imagined identity from his famous 1984 essay, In Essence. He refers to whiteness as the lie, the dream, that believes in itself completely as the truth um, and also as the universal standard. Charles Mills, one of my very favorite philosophers, in his last book on John Rawls, the famous political philosopher, um, defines whiteness as a failure to engage with the obvious. With respect to John Rawls' work, he looks at 2,000 pages of, uh, of writing on the issue of justice and finds that John Rawls devoted only six pages to the issue of race. And so he, uh, Charles Mills, refers to whiteness um, as, 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 the, as a failure to engage the obvious. Um, and also refers to ideal theory uh, for my philosophy folks in the room as a kind of whiteness. Um, ideal theory for him because it begins with, as its starting point, an imagined state, of, uh, uh, state uh, free of discrimination rather than a world that actually has been made and inhabited by uh, settler colonialism and slavery. Um, Sadia Hartman right, in her work, refers to whiteness as the thing that stands in, in order to understand the suffering and pain and disadvantage of the other, uh, specifically black peoples. Um, it needs, she says, whiteness needs to first imagine its own suffering as a site of identification in order to exercise empathy or to empathize with the other. I feel so sorry for X, for that person. That is so terrible. I can only imagine that thing happening to me and my children. So Sadia Hartman refers to whiteness as standing in for, uh, literally in the bodily sense, and I'll talk about that more in a few moments. Um, whiteness is so self-preservationist, right? That even it, in its attempted extension of empathy, of trying to empathize with the other, it needs to fundamentally imagine itself first. Um, I want to also put on the table that in my experience, whiteness relies on grotesque, large-scale, repetitive displays of violence to be moved, to respond to uh, forms of violence that are enacted upon other groups of people. Um, and it's important to name that logic, right? The, 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 the grotesqueness, the excessiveness with, with violent, of violence with which whiteness needs to be moved as, as perpetually harmful for those of us that live in closest proximity to violence, right? Um, I had a professor of black politics when I was in under, an undergraduate at Howard University, and he once asked us this question, what was it that moved white people to move during the, during the civil white rights movement? And his response was, it was not the moral fortitude or the discourse or speeches of Martin Luther King uh, or other civil rights leaders that moved masses of white people to move, but rather the images of women and men and children on television, in church regalia, being hosed down again and again and again with 70 pound water sprays like plastic objects attacked with police dogs in the context of nonviolent protest, right? And I'm asking us now to think of how the proliferation of all those images that are associated with Black Lives Matters, all of the police killings of Trayvon Martin, of Freddie Gray, of Walter Scott, of Alton Sterling, of Philando Castile, of my beloved Tamir Rice, how those images have caused a social response. And I want to ask yet again, who are those, who are those images for? 
right? So if it is the case that whiteness relies on the grotesque, on the self-identificatory uh, kinds of violence to be moved, this also is the reason that we have to better attend to the small scale, to the everyday, to our families, to our kinships, to work on these matters. Um, second practice, refusing empathy and its intent as moves to, vi to innocence. Refusing empathy and, its, and, and the int and intent as moves to white <coughs> innocence. Um, the I example that I offered above from Sadia Hartman, that white empathy acts as a self-referent in the context of black suffering and violence comes from a historical context. She offers this example of an abolitionist minister named John Rankin who's traveling through the South and witnesses an enslaved person being flayed open. And his response as he's writing to his brother, a slaveholder still, to try to convince him of his abolitionist standpoint is not that witnessing this grotesque display of violence moved him, but rather he could only but help imagine himself and his wife being similarly treated um, be in, in order to be moved, right? So this idea of empathy as, as a failure um, for, uh, for helping white people reckon with what the experiences are of racialized people um, comes out of her work. In addition to Sadia Hartman, I want to bring into the room Erin Manning's beautiful, beautiful work uh, that she's doing at the Sense Lab in Concordia um, uh, in the context of neurodiversity and whiteness, right? Uh, she describes empathy as a gesture of whiteness because it requires an identificatory frame that is mappable or imposable upon to or onto another person. It's that mapping then uh, in which the subjective is erased, that whiteness expresses itself as a racial logic, but also as a neurotypical response to everything. Um, I'll suggest one thing before moving to my third and final point. When can empathy be a good thing? When is empathy a good thing? All of us have witnessed, I think, really beautiful examples at work. It can perhaps be good, I offer, if it entails first the imagining and the full reckoning with the fullest conception of humanity that one can muster. Kim Katrin Milan, who has worked in the Toronto area forever, has this thing she says all the time, don't treat others as you want to be treated but treat them as you, a, as they would want to be treated. Don't treat others as you would want to be treated. Treat others as they would want to be treated. But that, of course, first entails a deep curiosity about the fullness of who that other human being is. Um, and with marginalized peoples, the willingness to both be curious and extend the fullest humanity to those groups is often the least via white folks. Um, and finally, uh, I think where, where I'll end, and it's, it's really a question more than anything. The most important site, the most painful and challenging site to develop strategies for dismantling white fragility um, is in our community-based and our non-for-profit uh, institutions. And to take that a step further, I would argue, actually is within our radical, multiracial, left-of-center collectives of community organizing. How do we, uh, as folks like Judith Butler asked us forever ago, how do we do community work when we are all solidly standing within the circle? When we are already in agreement fundamentally about what we are fighting for, what we're up against, and yet the same deeply familiar logics of white fragility and supremacy show up in our work again and again right at the moments that we believe that we are safe, that we are engaged from our years of work together as our bodies often begin to soften, how do we deal with that particular white fragility that comes into our most radical organizing and community work? Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Next, we will have uh, uh, Dr. Gaynor Watson Creed, who is a public health physician, a dedicated leader, and a passionate advocate for the role public health can play in advancing health equity. 
She is the Assistant Dean of Serving and Engaging Society for Dalhousie University's Faculty of Medicine and also serves as Chair of Engage Nova Scotia's board. In November 2019, Gaynor was named as one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women by the Women's Executive Network. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gaynor Watson Creek. Thank you for that introduction, and this is what powerful women do. They change the order of the panel without telling the moderator. <laughs> Thank you, Ajay. Um, so I am um, going to start by saying I am, I am not an academic, although I hold a faculty appointment uh, here in the Department of Medicine as, a, um, as an assistant dean. I don't consider myself to be an academic. I'm a physician. That is my, my background. And so what I'm going to uh, speak to doesn't come from extensive knowledge of critical race theory, because I'm going to tell you right now I don't have that. Um, but does come from my experiences as a physician, as a public health physician, uh, working in circles that are largely around equity and certainly um, as, a, as a black woman. And it's interesting to me because I, you know, I often start conversations about equity, diversity, and, and inclusion and my own experience with that by, by pointing out that when I walk into a room, um, I'm actually never sure what people are reacting to first. They may be reacting to the fact that I'm uh, a physician, they may be reacting to the fact that I'm a female physician, and they may be reacting to the fact that I'm black and a female physician, and all of those things, um, or any one of them, uh, can manifest in any, at any point in time. So, so I, I'm not an expert, but I will tell you what I, what I do know uh, some things about, uh, and one of the things that I, I'm fascinated about, and that comes up time and time again now in my role uh, in the Faculty of Medicine, is the way the human mind works to keep us comfortable. And so if you haven't, how many of you are at all familiar with the notion of implicit bias or implicit associations? Okay, so a good many. So for those of you who aren't, I'm just, I'm gonna give you a very, very Coles note, notes version. Um, the brain uh, works quickly and invisibly all the time, all the time, all the time to sort into looks same, looks different, just by a way of understanding the world. It's just how we're wired. It's just how we're programmed, okay? What we do with that programming and how we react to what the brain puts in front of us as its flawed interpretation of what's going around with us is, is the conversation around racism. But let's not pretend that those background heuristics in the brain uh, don't exist. And the reason they exist is because the brain wants to work quickly to not only help us figure out what's going on, but also to minimize energy use in doing that so that we're not expending tremendous amounts of energy trying to figure out a situation before we, before we enter into it. The problem is that that uh, is a flawed assessment by the brain. And when you get those flawed assessments, we call them biases, as soon as you name it as an implicit bias, two things happen. One thing uh, it, that happens is folks say implicit. Well, that means it's, it's intrinsic to me as a human being. I don't like the sound of that because it's also bias, and bias is bad, and I'm nice. I'm nice. I want to be a nice person. I like people, right? And so folks quickly react to the notion that these, these brain heuristics are, are running in a not particularly helpful way um, as something that is, uh, that, is, that is bad and that is wrong. And I think that's because what we want to be true about this world and what is actually true about this world are often quite different. And I have spent a tremendous amount of time in my career uh, working with people and institutions who go through the slow and painful process of waking up to that. We want nice to be true. We want the default to be that we can all get along and we all love each other. And when confronted by anything that challenges that, we retreat to a place. And so in thinking about this paper uh, that, that I put forward, which I do, I do really love, and, and I'm sharing widely this paper uh, on white pathological uh, white fragility, and thank you for naming it as pathology. Um, you know, I'm, I'm struck by the, the notion that uh, fragility, I think, can come from this place of us uh, being faced with that disconnect of what we want to be true and what is actually true uh, being different. For me, as a black woman, this disconnect manifests in a number of very tangible ways. It manifests when I show up, for example, in a faculty of medicine or a medical education conversation somewhere else in this country, and I'm confronted with a conversation which is we want to talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion, but we're not going to talk about whiteness as part of that. And I go, so we're going to leave out a big part of the population because we're uncomfortable? Or what's the reason for that? And, and the conversation we get into is an interesting one, and I've been in this conversation now for 20 years uh, as a physician. So when we are teaching in medical education, 
we will use uh, case studies as the way to present to new medical students, patient presents with this, here's the list of symptoms, what do you think the diagnosis is? The, how we define the patient often has a racialized uh, characteristic associated with it, unless the patient is white, in which case we leave it out. And so the challenge with that is that when you leave it out, the assumption made by everybody in the room, including the racialized groups in the room, is, well, then the person must be white because that's how we've all been socialized. And if we don't start naming that as an issue, we fail to see the ways in which that hidden construct is undermining our very attempts to do the thing we say we want to do, which is equity, diversity, and inclusion in our medical education, right? So, that, so that's one way it, it manifests. It diminishes the voice and visibility of a conversation about how racism exists in our world by almost pretending that it doesn't have to be an issue as long as we only name it for the racialized, racialized groups, we only identify the racialized groups. The second way it manifests um, is in uh, the way that I, you know, come across uh, what I'm going to call micro-invalidations rather than microaggressions every day. And the very fact that I choose to use the word micro-invalidation to me is, is um, emblematic of of how I choose to navigate uh, white fragility. Um, again, the, the equity, diversity, and inclusion portfolio in the Faculty of Medicine now fa uh, falls under me. And I'm getting asked all over the place to come and talk about uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I will uh, speak to how that's problematic in a moment. Um, but when I get into these conversations, one of the things I do like to point out to people um, is how microaggressions actually feed uh, racism in very, very insidious ways. As soon as you call it aggression, people go to the place of, but I'm not aggressive, I'm nice. Remember, we already established this, I'm nice, I want everybody to get along. So I actually call it micro-invalidations to sort of diminish that sense of, of threat. If you're not familiar with this terminology, these are the small things that are just insidious enough that you could pass them off, except I'm not sure I should pass it off because I think there was something that was not okay about that and maybe we should talk about it. If you have that gut check at all, chances are you are in a conversation where a micro-invalidation or a microaggression has reared its head. The example I use on a regular basis is with my, uh, my daughter and um, her white stepmother who is of, part, partly of, Le or sorry, wh white grandmother who is of Lebanese descent um, and very, very, very well-meaning. Um, and in uh, some circumstances will say to my daughter with her long, curly ringlets of hair, your hair is so difficult. And a few things are happening in that statement. One is, you're pointing out that her hair is not like your hair. Secondly, you're saying something negative about her hair, which she probably doesn't need to hear at the age of 13, right? And what are you setting up for her in terms of how she understands herself as a black woman going forward in this world, right? It's a tiny thing. There's a way in which you could say, grandma didn't mean anything by that. And grandma probably didn't mean anything by that, but grandma probably also didn't think about whether or not that was a significant statement, right? That's the type of thing that is micro-invalidation. It's the comments that I get when I'm walking through the, uh, the hallways, for example, on the Faculty of Medicine or other campuses, other buildings on campus, and somebody will say something to me about, your skin color and that shirt. <laughs> and I go, I know it was a compliment. And also, you just pointed out to me, again, that I'm not white, which, by the way, I already know. Thank you very much, <laughs> right? These are the ways in which uh, that disconnect around what we want to be true and what's actually true uh, manifests. And uh, you know, that last one in particular is, is interesting to me because um, what I'm reminded of when I walk into those situations is that I'm in a world that actually defines me by the color of my skin. The problem is I don't define me that way. And so the constant reminder that we are defining you by the color of your skin, heads up, we're going to do it again. Oh, look, we just did it. I don't really need, because I'm so much more than that. And I can talk to you about all the other things that I am, in addition to being uh, a black woman. Uh, so there's that. The third uh, thing that I, uh, I think manifests, by the way, by way of uh, white fragility, is, is the notion that fallacies of logic, and there are multitudes of them, uh, dozens if not hundreds of fallacies of logic that people will use to wind their way through an argument. Um, will rear their heads in response to any claim that racism is occurring or that racist actions that exist or, or that an uh, institution is racist, despite um, the strong evidence that something to the contrary is happening, that there, there's actually real 
uh, real issues happening in play. And these fallacies of logic are used very successfully, in fact, to deny the validity of, of the claims of racialized groups over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. It's the thing that happens when, some, when you know, a racialized group will make a comment on something um, like you know, street, street checks by police officers, for example, and a politician might say, yeah, well, of course the black community is going to say that because they think every, every, everything's a race issue. Where is, the, where is that a logical argument? Where does what just was stated by that black community and the statement made by the politician, where is the connect between those two that is a logical sequence of thinking, right? You don't need one. These fallacies of logic exist all the time and they successfully are used to undermine the, uh, the arguments of, uh, of these groups. And so I, I see that manifest. And again, I, you know, I would say I, th these things manifest despite the evidence to the contrary of how many times we see racialized groups uh, harmed uh, both you know, sort of physically and emotionally and mentally and socially and culturally um, by constructs of, of racism uh, in our communities. I spent some time uh, at some point in, in my career on a group called the One Nova Scotia Coalition. Some of you will know this work. And this was the Premier of Nova Scotia and the two party leaders uh, convening a round table in response to the Ivany Report, which some of you will know, uh, to talk about um, the state of the Nova Scotia economy. Now, I'm a public health physician, and when I get a call like this from the Premier, I go, either I've done something horribly wrong, or this is going to be really interesting. Uh, and so I agreed to sit on this panel not knowing what I was getting into, but as a public health physician, my training is to ask basically only one question. Who is experiencing a negative outcome? Who is not experiencing that outcome? And why is there a difference? And you go after the why until you find the answer. So the question I brought to the One Nova Scotia table was, who in the province of Nova Scotia is able to participate in our economy? And who is not able to participate in the economy because they are systematically and regularly excluded from those opportunities? And the initial answer was, any guesses? Nobody wanting to answer the question. So then the next question is, maybe we should see if we have any data on this. And the official response to that was, no data. we don't have the data because we're not collecting it. And then you ask, why aren't we collecting the data? Because, you know, government, isn't it kind of your job to be monitoring outcomes in this province? And the answer to that was, yeah, crickets again. So, so crickets, uh, in response to some of these challenging questions, again, are another way that we get to avoid engaging with what I think is fragility that we're meeting on the other end by those, by those leaders who are in a position of, of, of privilege. Um, you know, I say all of this knowing that um, the impact that it has on me and I think on colleagues is, is a toll that I... I, I wouldn't want to underestimate the burden of, and so when Ajay asked me initially if I would uh, participate in this panel, my response to him was, oh man, I don't, I don't know, I'm tired. I'm tired of these conversations. Uh, and, and the reason it's tiring is because if you can imagine, um, you know, when you are the brown face that is trying to point out the fallacies of logic at play, trying to point out the data discrepancies or lack of data at play, trying to point out the obvious and met with uh, a complete unwillingness to engage with that, um, you don't just get tired. You feel isolated, right? Um, you're alone in that room. I've been in the position as a medical student here. Now, this was some, you know, 25 years ago where I actually had professors say to me, um, you know, why are you the one who keeps bringing up the race issues? Do you have a race problem? <laughs> oh, yeah. I think I'm pointing out what everybody else sees, but oh my God, what do you do with that as a student, right? Um, these are the ways in which it can grind on you and grind on you and grind on you over years after years and decades after decades. And so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to uh, leave without saying anything about that. Having said all of that, I do think there are so, some solutions. Um, I think there are some particularly uh, creative ones. I think they are rooted in further discussion around the, the notion of whiteness. Um, and so I'm not going to say more about that right now, but maybe we'll come back to that during the discussion. Thank you very much for that. And last and certainly not least, 
We have uh, Dr. Christina Rojas, who is the uh, full professor in the Departments of Political Science, as well as the director of the Institute of Political Economy at Carleton University, uh, where I had the good fortune of studying with her. Uh, Christina's academic research interests include post-colonial theory, social policy, indigeneity, and citizenship. She's the author of many, many books, articles, special issues dealing with civilization and violence, the histories of colonialism, narratives and imaginations of citizenship in Latin America, elusive peace, international, national, and local dimensions of conflict in Colombia, and honestly, the list goes on and on. I would flag, as I did at our roundtable earlier, one article from 2007 that blew my mind and directed my thinking in this direction, which was called uh, International Political Economy and Development Otherwise. And it was just that notion of the otherwise that uh, makes Christina such a valuable perspective when we have conversations like this. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Christina Rojas. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my life is simple. I am a professor. I teach all the time. I love teaching. I have a lot of students. And maybe that's why I am going to talk about teaching at the classroom, something that I do there. Uh, and I do research also with uh, indigenous women in, in Bolivia. I'm from Colombia. And I think all these uh, issues shape my problems. Uh, and what I'm going to talk sometimes is not seen as a problem for a lot of people, and I think they are right. Uh, but uh, when I look at the everyday life of my country, and I do, uh, it's important. I remember once uh, I gave a talk at Carton about my research on indigenous women. And one guy raised his hand and said, Christina, why you are you spending so much time when there is only 4% of the population that have this problem, mm -hmm. no? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, sometimes, yeah, it's the way of seeing it. But um, I am going to start, as I said this morning, uh, and I think that racism is a product of colonialism. And if we need to end racism, we need to question the colonial categories, the colonial divisions, and this is very uh, difficult to do. And uh, one uh, category that is at the center of this is the division between the humans and the non-humans. Uh, looking very fast historically, uh, in this division was at the center of what is called the uh, knowledge, the coloniality of knowledge, and also the coloniality of beings. One, because uh, in the division between savages at that time of 17th, 16th centuries, and the civilized, was that the savages were closer to nature. And because they were closer to nature, it means that a, they didn't have knowledge. B, they couldn't govern themselves. Somebody has to govern them. And that C, they could be eliminated closer to animals uh, if they put any kind of resistance to the power of the uh, white uh, people. But also because the uh, uh, white people, by biology, giving a biology, uh, biological uh, name to the problem and to classify them as nature, also make them innocent. And the uh, whole problem of, of difference and, and discrimination and, and violence against were erased. That is, it disappeared. It was rather, uh, when we look at the uh, how the colonizer conceived themselves, it was a noble type to do because they were civilizing and they were emancipating uh, uh, indigenous uh, people. So that's uh, very, very uh, important. So um, how to recover this history? Because at, at the end, 
uh, this lack of knowledge, and, or, or rather the knowledge on the part of, of the colonizers, means that uh, they were able to take distance and also to never mix with the other group of people. That is, they, they, they didn't need it. They, they didn't need it to establish a dialogue. As uh, Enrique Dussel uh, in Latin America will mention, uh, uh, you don't need them. That is, you can perfectly go on as they have doing for centuries and centuries and centuries, talking to themselves, talking to themselves because the source of knowledge is there. Not anymore, and not anymore is partly in part, you have described it well as activists, because the work that they are doing, uh, 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 like bl uh, life, Black Lives Matter or indigenous people in Latin America, they are the ones that have put this problem at the forefront, not universities, not universities in Peru, in Ecuador, in, in Nicaragua, everywhere, Mexico, the Zapatistas, they uh, have bring uh, this problem. But other, the other uh, part uh, is also the climate uh, change that have raised the issue of, of how close are nature from society, how close are nature from culture, and what happened when we separate both. Think about Australia, for example. That is, is a good example. So that uh, helped a, a little bit to, to uh, overcome that uh, problem. Um, so the issue and the question that AJ asks is how, what can we do about uh, uh, that? Here uh, I get uh, inspiration from some Latin American authors, especially Marisol de la Cadena, uh, that's very well read, and also Laura Segato, who's an Argentinian working in, in, in Brazil. So uh, it's especially uh, working in what Laura Segato called counter pedagogies. How can we do counter pedagogies so to uh, overcome this big uh, divide. And uh, he, uh, she, I'm sorry, she mentioned uh, one of the important things to develop is what she called new technologies of sociability. That is, that's a new area where we can work. People have worked ages and ages about technologies of productivity and how we can produce more, how we can produce more efficiently, but how we can get together more, how we can build community. That's an area that is uh, important to, to uh, explore, but also changing the attitude of we as researchers or we as, as uh, professors, and is uh, be this open to new questions, do we open to new kind of reasoning as somebody, we need to slow down our way of reasoning. We, we cannot continue thinking that we have the truth, but rather how people that has been in this situation for ages, how they have been able to resist and to communicate and to have alternatives because they are there, but it needs that we open uh, our eyes and our mind to these other uh, uh, topics. Um, and um, also start thinking about not like uh, kind of Western kind of knowledge or about rationality and abstraction and individual, uh, individualism in our uh, uh, way of thinking, but rather in a uh, establishing linkages, establishing relationship between things, relationship between environment and human, a relationship between a, a way of linking. In the previous, we talk about com communality, that is how people get in common, but this is a new way of getting in common. If you study political science, it's pluralism, no? it's just, let's have the interests of people together, individuals, no, is how there are a lot of interconnection and intermingling uh, between things that are not very clear, that are not even the same type of interest, but people can get together to, to, to solve uh, this. Uh, and um, yeah, 
being able to open to new, new or open these ways of, of this classification and uh, think about uh, uh, relations and, 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 and yeah, different ways of, of communicating and uh, emphasis in entanglement rather than, than uh, individuals. And uh, finally, and I think that's where I, it comes to what I do at my class that I want to share with you. Uh, in every class, development, political economy, social policy, I always bring readings from the South, readings of people from the South, readings from indigenous people, readings from Afro-descendants, readings for, or, and, and that's amazing. I ask my students that they have never uh, 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 did that, uh, and they are in four year or master, even a PhD. So this is very important to open, open to what the uh, uh, rational man, white man, uh, uh, <laughs> has been doing. That is the center of definition of everything. So the women are the other of him, or the savages are the other of him, and everything that. But we have other uh, reference, other things, and also in terms of dialogue with them, who they are, that is what they do, who, where do they come from. It's, it's an amazing wealth of, of information that we tend to, to not to look at that. I learned that and I finished with that, with an uh, um, indigenous woman that I work in, in, in Bolivia, uh, I work with her, and she uh, was invited by an NGO in Bolivia uh, to attend to a class of um, uh, feminism. No? And it was three days, and I, I saw her at the end of the class, and I said, Sister Cristina, I, I don't understand. That woman was telling me all the time, learn to think about yourself. Think how important you are. Think about how uh, uh, you everything that you do should be for your own benefit. You know, I say, but how can I do that without my family, my animals, my territory, my dad? It was the perfect relational kind of thinking. You know? and, and she was trying to, to say, no, that, that no, think about you. you know? and that's how much we harm we can do as a professor. So thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. Uh, we're gonna have a microphone. Okay, I understand. Uh, so as we open to questions, I understand there are some students who had uh, submitted questions already. Is that is that the case, Jocelyn? Um, or no? Okay. So then we'll just open the uh, uh, floor to questions. Maybe I'll take one or two uh, at the same time, and then we'll ask the people to respond. Please go ahead. Um, we have a saying in the community sometimes where, where we preface what we're going to say. And I'm going to preface my question with, I'm not being smart nor funny. And that's what sometimes we say. <laughs> um, I'm not being smart nor funny in my question. But given that the topic is white fragility and, and unpacking that, I'm a little bit surprised. Where's all the white people who mm. get to... Uh, Tell, they're the ones that perpetrate this white fragility, yet it's the people that are subjected to the negative uh, mm -hmm. uh, results of white fragility that have to now explain what it's all about. So where's the white people? And what have they got to say about why they do these things and how they do it and how they think it up? So that's been running through my mind. Thank you. That's a wonderful question. I, I actually treat that as a question to me. Uh, <laughs> And um, honestly, the, an the answer to your question, and I'm not trying to be funny about it, it's just smart nor funny, smart nor funny sorry, <laughs> smart nor funny, is that uh, I was afraid of what would happen uh, in terms of how the conversation might not be focused if we were to do that. But uh, hopefully what will come out of this, and one of the things that we are, that we want to do as part of this, this program is to launch a something that I'm going to talk about uh, towards the end of the talk, and maybe that will help us to kind of think about where that role of, of, of the white people in this work is going to look at. So I'll just leave it at that, and uh, we'll come back to your question by the end of today. Uh, I see a hand over here. Yeah, Riley? 
Thank you. Um, my question is directed more towards uh, Dr. Zellers. Um, I was raised in the United States. More specifically, I spent a decade in South Florida where we talk about race and race issues very openly. And it was a shock to me when I moved here, honestly, and people here openly refuse to talk about issues of racism because, and the excuse I hear a lot is, we're not as bad as the United States. We don't have the same issues as the United States, which to me is, I find ridiculous because just because they're not as televised does not mean they're not as bad or not as prominent. So how can we approach conversations about race with people who truly don't believe it is as big of a problem because we're not as bad as our neighbor to the south? Yeah, thanks, thanks for that question. That's, that feels really important. Um, maybe here's what, where I'll you know, put in a little plug for implicit bias. Uh, uh, implicit bias, like understanding it more and understanding how, how to use it as like a, a technology, so to, so to speak. So I, um, I have done implicit bias work forever. I am the, the lead trainer for the Human Rights Commission in Ottawa. It's a lot of fun training there. Um, they really struggle with issues of anti-blackness nationally and figuring out how to name them. Um, and I started doing implicit bias. I started being really curious about implicit bias after hating it as for like 20 years when I, when I, when I was in Quebec and kept bumping into walls that really mattered because they were like regarding my children's schools and the kind of violences that were happening in those spaces um, that would be really easy to name in the United States but were like impossible to name. So I guess what I'll say about implicit bias is I've learned to use it as a tool that begins with if you have a brain, you have a bias, and it takes some weight off, right? Now, I'm coming to white supremacy and white fragility, right? You don't know that yet, mm -hmm. but I like coming in. I like using the science. I like using um, that as a starting point. We all have it. Here's how it works. One of the reasons it's so intent important. One of the reasons intent is so important to me as a move to innocence and being really aware of how intent operates in our conversations about race, is because at the moment you say this is how the brain works, it nat it naturally differentiates. Um, well, that thing that's like me and that thing that's not like me the stuff with which we make those quick determinations already comes in from information about how the world works, right? How the world has been structurally situated. So implicit bias trainings have been super important for me as a way of saying, yes, let's talk about something we all as human beings have, knowing in my heart, I'm not gonna let white people in the room off the hook. I'm gonna get to that hard place I wanna get as someone who knows everything about slavery and how this world has been turned on its head, um, but wants to work through all these things like intent um, because, of course, going into those trainings, um, also one of the things that's not done well about them is for, you know, folks have the opportunity to say, well, if it's just like a human thing you know, that everybody does and it's not really so bad, like I'm not really responsible for it. Um, so I think that we, we have to study implicit bias more and for those of us that do these workshops we have to start naming them critical implicit bias workshops and really bringing in history uh, and figuring how to do that in a way that's really success like successfully melds the science of implicit bias it grapples with that issue of intent and then gets us to the ending plane of how how history has made all of us the way that we are the way that we perceive each other and that millisecond judgment that happens, like me, not like me, the brain does, from this old historical place of survival, right? I think we have to learn how to muddle through that better. So, I mean, this is, this is a whole, I, I could say so much more, but I'll just name implicit bias as something that I fought ardently against for 20 years, but living here as an American has made me think, oh shit, I just need to get better coming into these conversations. And if everybody's glazed over and defensive, I'm just not getting anywhere. The bodies of my children are what made me come into this mm -hmm. in a different way. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Hi. Um, just a, a brief comment of uh, if I want to reconcile the two uh, uh, presentations. Because there is one thing you say that was very, very important. You say self-preservation. And uh, what I feel is it, it may vary right, from even from one city to another city across Canada, and from one country to another country. What I found here is the sense of self-preservation, it's extremely strong. If you compare it even to 
Montreal. I've worked in Montreal and I've worked in New York City. What I realized even down in the city, down in New York, if you work hard, if you can produce sometimes more than the white person, all of a sudden, you kind of like, you are liked. And I'm not saying it's paradise, but um, my experience was, in fact, as a banker, kind of a produce, you, you basically, you're black, but all of a sudden, you're turning green, <laughs> right? The white kid who's next to you remain white for some reason. The boss doesn't like him because he didn't see green. So that's the sense here. What I found is even if you can give the best, you still not end. You still not end. Uh, that's, and when I, realize, when I say, self, when you say sense of preservation, it kind of like that's what I, I, I've experienced. Mm -hmm. Like for years. Even if you Einstein and Oppenheimer happen to one person, right. you're still not around. You, you still form away. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. If you bring in mana from, from heaven, it won't matter. <laughs> <laughs> it won't matter. And, uh, just to quote um, James Baldwin, who say once when Atlanta, basically, they decided they're gonna change from kind of like the model they have that down south to become a top city. It's when the white elite decided, okay, we are now, we're too busy making money to be racist. Right, right. Right? And we saw now what Atlanta had become. We too ra we too busy making money to be racist, so that's why I'm, I'm, I I kind of like the sen the sense of preservation. It's mm -hmm. extremely 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 strong, and I think it's something that is really detrimental to any society, mm -hmm. whether it's a diverse or white or whatever it is. It's something that is the, the, the very very detrimental. Thank you. That's one. Thank you. In the back there. Hi, thank you. Um, I have two questions sort of related to each other. Um, so one of them, why do we, do we presume that there is an ontological essence within whiteness and race? Um, because um, oftentimes I think, um, is a person from Ethiopia the same as a person from Eritrea, for example, when both of these countries have been torn by ethnic conflict? or Oftentimes I'm thinking, uh, but anyway, I'm just gonna go to the second question just so I don't <laughs> spend so much time. So I think the main issue is actually the system of racial classification. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, the problem, this is a very Nord American centric thinking. These are very connected with the colonialism that happened here, right from the British and the French and et cetera. But during the same time that the the British colonized these new words, we had other forms of colonialism. We have, you know, the Ottoman Empire, where, you know, no one talks about the Ottoman Empire. Or, so basically what I'm trying to say, <laughs> that perhaps white supremacy is also resultant from our system of racial classification, who actually presume that history is universal and only mm -hmm the history that happened in North America actually matters. W would anybody care to comment? Yeah. Christina, did you want to speak to that? Use that microphone, please, Christina. Ontological. Yeah. Okay. It's okay now. I'm just worried about feedback, but you try this. The one to hold. Hello. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's first the question about the ontological difference. For me, uh, ontological doesn't refer to essentialize. That mm -hmm. there is not an e essence, and. Uh, uh, rather, uh, ontological refers more to uh, ways, different ways of making worlds, 
different ways of, of, of projecting into the world. So in that case uh, in, uh, of indigenous people, there are a lot of different groups and there are different ways of, of making their words. Taking an example of Bolivia, Aymaras and Quechuas and uh, Guaranis and that, they are doing differently, but because they, are, they do different, they are not different ontologies. I don't know if that's, uh, the second uh, part is the role of history. Um, the same, I, I don't think that there is only one history. Uh, and, and, and here I, I believe a lot what Chakravarti has written about history in the sense that the problem is trying to think that there is only mm -hmm. one way of uh, having time as linear and moving within the same time. And there are multiple ways of, of, of going through uh, time. And, and the, 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 the liberation, I will say, and, and, and in that sense, yes, that it, in India is different than in, in Turkey or, or, or Europe or in Latin America, but the same matter. You know. But uh, is the, the way that at a certain moment Europe universalized history, that it was the Eurocentric, that thing that we, every single group have to go through the same history, have to go through the same pattern in order to be civilized or in order to be modern. Mm -hmm. I don't know, that's answer the question. Mm. Okay. Next question, uh, Tim? Where is Tim? Tim's over Tim. here. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for their presentations um you know as a as an educator as a teacher it's uh you know these conversations are really important to have in your classroom um and it helped remind me um about different ways i think of sort of teaching and speaking about um white fragility white supremacy to students to think about the ways in which um it moves beyond skin to system mm -hmm. right to think about the ways in which it articulates itself as property a sense of ownership or entitlement, right? To think about the pathological. Um, and all of that reminds me of the ways in which, you know, whiteness and white fr fr fragility can be read as forms of investment. Um, and, and Ajay, the, you know, what you said at the beginning, wait, right, the, it, the colonial project requires mm -hmm. a never returning, right? It requires the continued mm -hmm. suppression of that, right? That, that there's an investment in that project that must continue. Mm -hmm. um, but the question that I have, and, and I think uh, it was touched on a little bit by some of your, your presentations, um, is really about a question of care, um, and care for yourself, and care for community, and care for others. Um, there is a weight to the work of combating systems of oppression, white fragility, whether that work is in the classroom with students, whether that work is as a professional, uh, it, whether that work is as a manager or a university official or in administration, there is a work to being recognized and read in a certain way that isn't the way and to have to continually have to speak about it. Mm -hmm. um, and there is also a cost yeah. to, to doing that. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to, to, to that to, to that and the ways in which we can do kinds of care for ourselves and our communities and the people we're in conversation with. Who would like to kick us off there? Um, maybe I'll give the first yeah. Um, and thank, thank you for the question. Uh, have we, okay, is this working at all? Can you hear me? Yeah. No? no? No, not great. Jocelyn to the rescue. <laughs> oh, uh, how's this, better? Yeah, yeah okay. okay, all right, thanks, Jocelyn. Um, it, and I did mention this in, in, in my remarks. Um, it, it, my comment would be that it relates actually to the question that was asked earlier about uh, where are the white faces up here on this panel? Mm. And I, it, this is the second time in my career that I've found myself on an all person of color panel um, talking about issues that largely affect uh, black community as an example. And the question comes up every single time. Um, 
it, one of the ways that I do that I do find helpful um, in sort of uh, dealing with the weight and the burden is to is to find the white allies, and they do exist. Mm -hmm. um, I have the privilege of working with uh, with Danny Graham as the CEO of Engage Nova Scotia in my Engage Nova Scotia work. Um, every time Danny stands in front of me to take on a conversation about equity, diversity, and inclusion in whatever audience he is, I breathe a little bit of a sigh of relief. Danny is a white Cape Breton lawyer. If people aren't going to listen to him, there's no hope. And they do, it's a thing, right? And I get to step back, I go, great. I've had times where I've had to coach others, including my own kids, to take a similar approach. Um, so in the classroom, for example, um, you know, I, many of us have had this experience of having sort of to prepare our kids for what we believe to be inevitable, which is the, uh, you know, the presence of racism rearing its head in whatever setting they're in. And sure enough, that happened to my son um, at age nine in his elementary school. And I was a little surprised that it took that long um, for something significant enough to sort of bubble up to the school administration. The administration's immediate knee-jerk reaction was, um, so how about we put him in front of the classroom and get him to explain to the class how terrible this was? And I went, okay, kids, stand back. <laughs> <laughs> Mama's got this. No, you're not going to do that, right? Because when you do that, you actually make this the black kid's problem, and it was never the black kid's problem to begin with, right? So finding those, those allied voices who actually can carry the conversation, I think, is a strategy that maybe we're not often afforded the opportunity to look for, but, I, but I, it can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll just, um, I'll, I'll just jump in here quickly um, because that the, your, your question and comment really touched me. So um, the first thing that came to mind, the first word I wrote down was like really working on like the non-disposability of our people. Um, mm -hmm. We witness and see public conflicts all the time. We are so small as academics. We disparage each other all the time. How can we better embody a politics, a belief, like this radical belief in not disposing of one another? Again, for me, that comes right back down to the work that's most loving that black people have always done. It's a bedrock of abolition. How can we not do that? How can we really resist that and dig deeper to find where that comes from in ourself? Because to flip that around a little bit, the way that the reason that we're so quick to do that to one another is because of the way that we have embodied the logics of state violence that have been weaponized against us forever. It's the way it's circled back in on us and sits in our belly. So that that's one thing that comes to mind. Um, be of community service, spend time with children, be of service. I mean, I know it sounds like really silly and I'm speaking to an academic, we don't have a lot of time, but we have to make it. We came here from my, my daughter's school where Lindell was, was as well. My, sis, my daughter sh shares a classroom with, with his daughter. And I went in because it's literacy day to read a book. I had like 40 minutes. And I was scrambling to put some ideas down as I was chasing my kids out <laughs> the door at seven to go to three different schools, right? So 40 minutes, okay, yeah, I can come in and read. And I read a book in French, right? Oof, let me tell you. And I made the ch kids cheer for me really loud. So all of that, I'm just giving a little bit of personal information, but be of service, be of service. Nothing grounds you and centers you than being of service. And as academics, single mom, three kids, three different schools, I'm stretched. I can find 40 minutes to stumble through some damn French because <laughs> it's good for that connection. It's good for me, it's good for that community. It's good for my daughter to see her grown mother stumble through French and be humble about it. Uh, okay, and then the last thing. Um, I'm, I've been, the other thing I wrote down was like radical truth. How do we do that in ways that are probably more useful in our community work than in the academy, right? We're new, mm -hmm. I'm not tenured, I don't know if you're tenured yet, um, but how can we better, be better s in our responses radically? How can we speak radical truth? I had a moment with people that I know very, very well, my allies, my white allies, I've worked together with for six, seven years now. And one of them said something so shocking and disappointing to me last week that I you know, was saying to my partner, like I literally didn't know how to respond. And, the f and because I didn't know how to respond with this person that I love, it means I've got to work on my radical truth. What should have come out of my mouth at that moment was, damn, I can't believe you just said that. 
I profoundly disagree with that and it hurts, let's talk about it. But you know, I think there are different ways we can come into our body, you know, somatic, some of us are yogis, 20 years, but how can we better embody radical mm -hmm. truth telling in spaces that are safe for us? The academy is not safe for us, we know that. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are some ideas I'll just throw into the room. Thanks for that question. Thank you so much. I mean, we're, we're actually at time. I think that is actually a pretty fantastic way to ground ourselves as by way of a conclusion. Um, the last thing that I would add is that one of the things that uh, we were hoping to launch this semester uh, was essentially building on some of this, the idea that, you know, a lot like activists, people in the community, uh, racialized profs, etc., take on a lot of that care burden work to kind of make the same argument over and over and over again, to always fight back against kind of basically what's largely the same and not particularly sophisticated opinions because this stuff has been established in the literature over 40 years. Uh, so one of, the, one of the concrete things that we're thinking about doing uh, is to actually have a drop-in session whereby uh, this happens, it will meet every, uh, every month for this drop-in session and it would be a space for basically white people who feel like they have lots of questions that need specific answering, but are afraid of being judged in public for it. The, the, the motivation, and it sounds kind of sketchy, the motivation for this <laughs> comes literally, everything I do is about metaphors, and I was thinking long and hard when I was writing that piece about pathological white fragility, and in the end I thought, well, if something's fragile, like a porcelain vase, you don't transport it in, in checked luggage. So it's okay to be fragile, but let's, we, there are steps that we can take to try and build up our resiliency. And I think that those of us who are fortunate enough to have salaries that we draw from the university, if we can find 40 minutes once a month to just have a drop-in cafe, have a drop-in pub, meet, wherever it is people go, hockey rinks, I, I actually don't know, um, <laughs> and just be able to ask the questions without fear of judgment, uh, that could be one thing, and uh, we would encourage you all to think about maybe one thing that you could do to try and, and, and build that project. So, Kevin, I don't know if you, would you want to say a few words? Um, or? Um, sure. I'll yeah, okay, yeah, I'll leave it to you. Uh, really, just a one agenda item uh, just to, to close, uh, close this down for today, but uh, my name is Kevin Quigley. I'm the director of the McKechnie Institute for Public Policy and Governance. Uh, we're delighted to play a role in hosting and supporting this uh, important conversation today and the roundtable that we hosted at the McKechnie a little bit earlier. Uh, always a challenge to try to keep momentum going, so I'm really pleased to hear Dr. Parastram talk about initiatives that will follow this, and we're really delighted also that, uh, that Ajay joined us at the McKechnie Institute as a founding fellow. The McKechnie Institute plays the, the role of trying to create spaces and form for people to have important public policy discussions, and we work across a number of different policy areas. But we were really delighted that uh, Ajay stepped forward and, and played a leadership role in helping to organize the panel today and uh, the round table, and uh, we'll be doing some more work in this area in the future. So thank you so much, Ajay, actually, for the work you've done. Uh, Uh, thanks so much to the panelists. I will provide them with a token of our appreciation as soon as I can find it. Oh, I see Jocelyn has got them. So um, uh, on that note, thanks so much for coming out. Really uh, delighted to see such a, a turnout. And uh, watch the space. We'll be having more events like this in the future. And including next Monday, we talked about the panel. I think uh, Ajay flagged that panel that's next Monday at 5 o'clock that Tari Ajadi and uh, Keisha Jeffries have pulled together on uh, the new Nova Scotia framework around African uh, heritage. Okay, so thanks so much, and we will see you next Monday, I hope. Thank you.